SpaceX was all set for the ninth Starship test flight until something changed. New developments at Starbase suggest the rocket might not be ready after all. Let's unravel the signals pointing to deeper issues. Starship 35, designated for Flight 9, successfully completed a long-duration 60-second static fire test last week to validate the post-Flight 8 engine-related fixes. It is now back at the production facility for final pre-launch preparations, including system diagnostics, software integration, and inspections of the avionics, hydraulic systems, and Raptor engines. Meanwhile, Booster 14, the super-heavy first stage assigned to this flight, was rolled out to the launch site on Monday night. It was then placed atop the orbital launch mount, and teams began final works on the booster to prepare it for launch. A notable step was the removal of the alignment pins from the launch mount, which are typically used to precisely align the booster for installation and safe removal. Their removal usually signals that the booster is not expected to be lifted off again and is structurally secured for launch. However, just four days later, the expectation flipped. On Friday evening, the booster was carefully lifted off the launch mount, without the aid of alignment pins, and transported back to the production site. This unexpected rollback raised concerns about its readiness. The most likely explanation is that the booster needs repairs, though the extent remains unclear. This marks the first rollback of a Super Heavy this close to a planned launch, which hints at a potentially serious technical issue that cannot be addressed at the launch pad. However, there's also a more routine possibility. In past launches, SpaceX has frequently accessed the forward dome area of the booster, which houses critical components like battery packs, wiring harnesses, and grid fin actuators for last-minute tweaks. Typically, they do this by removing the hot stage ring above the dome. But currently, there are no cranes at the launch site capable of lifting the hot stage ring off the booster. The two large cranes at the site were reconfigured weeks ago to lift the Pad B launch mount, so they can no longer reach high enough to serve as a booster on the pad. This leaves rollback to the production site as the only option, where, inside the mega bay, SpaceX has the infrastructure to access the booster's top and work on the forward dome. If this rollback is purely for forward dome access and minor adjustments, the booster could return to the pad within days. But if structural or avionics issues are involved, it may need major work, delaying Flight 9 further. Meanwhile, another development added to the launch uncertainty. A Raptor vacuum engine was recently seen exiting Mega Bay 2, though its exact origin isn't confirmed. If this engine was removed from Ship 35, it suggests an engine swap occurred after the May 12th static fire due to issues identified, meaning another static fire test may be required. However, there's also the chance this is the same engine that was pulled after the May 1st static fire anomaly and replaced before the May 12th test. If that's the case, this engine is likely just exiting after post-removal diagnostics, meaning no new engine swap has occurred. A third possibility is that the engine belongs to Ship 36, which is currently inside Mega Bay 2, undergoing outfitting ahead of its own static fire campaign. In the coming days, if Ship 35 returns to the Massey facility, it would confirm that a recent engine swap took place, and a third static fire is required. However, if Ship 35 moves directly to the launch site instead, it indicates the engines are cleared and the ship is ready for Flight 9. Initial notums and navigational warnings suggested SpaceX was targeting no earlier than May 22nd for the launch, but the recent rollback of Booster 14 altered that plan. The new tentative date is May 27th, though this is still subject to vehicle readiness, weather, and FAA license. Regarding the launch license, on May 15th, the FAA issued a license modification to SpaceX, authorizing the mission profile for Flight 9. However, it's crucial to recognize that this modification does not constitute a full launch approval. The FAA explicitly states that SpaceX cannot proceed with Flight 9 until the agency either accepts the final mishap investigation report for Flight 8, already submitted by SpaceX, or issues an official return to flight determination. Until then, the launch remains on hold. For Flight 9, the FAA has expanded air and maritime exclusion zones around the launch and landing sites, as well as near the Turks and Caicos Islands in response to flights 7 and 8, which ended in failures that scattered debris back to Earth. Flight 8 alone disrupted roughly 240 flights, and over two dozen aircraft had to divert due to falling debris, highlighting the serious safety concerns that now shape Starship's launch licensing. According to the license document, SpaceX appears to be stepping away from attempting a tower arm catch for the booster this time, and is instead planning a controlled water landing in the Gulf of America. The company is expected to test a higher angle of attack during re-entry, which increases aerodynamic drag and slows the booster down more rapidly.
However, this also leads to significantly higher thermal and structural loads due to the intense air compression and heating. This maneuver is likely aimed at collecting valuable data on how Super Heavy withstands extreme re-entry conditions, crucial for validating its design under future high-energy return trajectories. While unconfirmed, this more aggressive re-entry profile may be one of the reasons SpaceX chose a splashdown approach over a catch attempt, as it introduces added risk and uncertainty in vehicle control and structural performance. Shifting the focus to the second launch pad, significant progress has been made at the site in the past week alone. Following the installation of the orbital launch mount on the 12th, teams are now working to secure it to the support legs and begin integrating it with the surrounding ground systems. Interestingly, welding operations were observed at the leg launch mount interface, which suggests that SpaceX might be permanently affixing the mount to the legs. If that's the case, it contradicts earlier expectations that the pad BOLM would follow a modular, removable design. This assumption was largely based on the visible bolt holes on all four legs of the mount, a clear sign that might be designed for easy detachment and swap outs. This concept made sense from an operational efficiency standpoint, because post-launch refurbishment at Pad A often involves structural repairs, re-welding, plumbing fixes, and thorough inspections that can take weeks. A removable mount, on the other hand, would allow SpaceX to remove the entire mount, send it off-site for servicing, and roll in a fresh unit, dramatically reducing turnaround time. But the current welding activity at Pad B raises doubts about that design philosophy being implemented, at least for now. One possibility is that the welds are temporary, used only to hold the mount precisely in place for alignment purposes before bolting begins. Whether the mount ends up being permanent or modular remains unclear, but with integration work ramping up, we should get a definitive answer in the coming days. SpaceX conducted a critical water bag load test on Tower B Chopstick Arms Friday afternoon, an essential step toward validating the structure for future rocket stacking and catching operations. Four massive water bags, two mounted on each arm, were used to simulate the kind of load the arms would experience during real operations. Once in place, the bags were gradually filled with water until each held around 100 tons, bringing the total simulated load to 400 tons. This weight replicates the dynamic and static forces the arms would face during real-world handling of a ship or booster. Once filled, the arms were raised to their highest position on the tower and held there for about an hour. During this time, sensors monitored the structural response of the arms and tower, measuring deflection, stress distribution, hydraulic pressure, and joint deformation. Engineers likely assessed whether the structure stayed within safe elastic limits, confirmed load path stability, and checked for unexpected torsional or lateral instabilities. After the hold, the arms were lowered, marking what appears to be the final major load test before Tower B is cleared for operational use. Interestingly, this test differed from the 700-ton water bag test conducted on Tower A last October, just ahead of the first-ever booster catch attempt during Flight 5. The reduced 400-ton load on Tower B may be due to its shorter arms, which reduce the lever arm length and, in turn, the bending moment acting on the carriage. A shorter moment arm means lower internal forces during lift or catch operations, allowing the system to handle the load with less mechanical stress and structural demand compared to Tower A. Since their installation in January, Tower B chopsticks have undergone extensive testing, vertical lifts, horizontal translations, and arm articulation exercises. This recent water bag test may mark the final qualification step before full-scale operations begin. Elon Musk has hinted that a Starship catch using the tower arms is planned later this year, assuming upcoming launches go as planned. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. We finally have a clear answer as to why Intuitive Machine's Nova Sea lander tipped over during its attempted moon landing earlier this year. As part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, the IEM-2 mission launched in February to deliver the Nova Sea Athena lander to the moon's south polar region to study water ice and test new technologies for future exploration. After a nominal liftoff, separation, and smooth cruise, Athena entered lunar orbit on March 3rd and began preparations for descent. The descent began as planned on March 6th with Athena autonomously heading for the surface. The target was the Mons Mouton region, about 5 degrees from the lunar south pole. However, during the final descent phase, the lander suffered multiple failures that led to an off-nominal landing and mission loss. After weeks of data review, Intuitive Machines has identified the key factors behind the failure. The primary issue was with the lander's laser altimeters, crucial for altitude measurement during descent. 
These sensors suffered from signal noise and distortion, likely from internal interference, making it unable to determine its distance from the surface, which disrupted terminal descent accuracy. The problem was worsened by the low solar angle at the pole, casting long shadows and creating low contrast lighting. This severely affected Athena's optical navigation system, which relies on recognizing surface features like craters and boulders to adjust its path. Altogether, a combination of faulty altitude sensing, challenging terrain, poor lighting, and impaired optical navigation caused the lander to misjudge the landing site and descend into a shallow crater just 250 meters off target. The impact tipped the lander on its side, and its solar panels couldn't get enough sunlight due to both the crater's shadows and its orientation, cutting off power and communications. Still, Athena operated for about 13 hours, long enough to transmit valuable mission data before losing power. NASA's Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment 1 Suite, which includes a test drill to analyze subsurface regolith for volatiles like water ice, returned useful initial data. Lunar Outpost's map rover couldn't deploy, but still collected surface measurements from inside the lander. Athena's failure closely mirrors that of Intuitive Machine's earlier lunar lander, Nova Sea Odysseus, which also landed on its side in February 2024 due to a landing leg failure. Despite the issue, Odysseus remained functional for about a week and completed scientific tasks. According to Intuitive Machines, future Nova Sea missions will build on these hard-earned lessons by enhancing sensor redundancy, refining hazard detection software, and improving terrain relative navigation to handle the moon's challenging low-light conditions, marking a critical step toward more reliable lunar exploration. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.